श्री गुरुभ्यो नम गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देवो महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरुवे नम सदाशिव सरंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यमा अस्मदाचार्य पर्यता वंदे गुरु परंपरा ओम सखनाबद सखनपुन सखवीर करवागे तेजस्वीना वतीदमस्तुमावत्शावके ओम शांति 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 योगेन चित्त पतेन वाचा मलम शरीर से चैत्यक योपाकोत्तम मुनीन प्रवर मुनीना पतंजलि कांजलि मानकोस्मी वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू सो वी आर लर्निंग अबाउट द अष्टांग योग इन द साधन पाद ऑफ पतंजलि वी जस्ट हैव अ क्विक रीकैप द पर्पस ऑफ अष्टांग योग इज to improve our capacity to do abhyasa vairagya but there is a particular insight in this way that he has given the ashtanga yoga because he wants us to understand the main sadhana is upasana you know in fact if you take the whole scriptures the vedas vedas are four different compilation by vyasa but together they are giving us in logically three important things karma upasana and jnana karma kanta upasana kanta and jnana kanta or they are not paginated like this but this is the logical progress that you perform karma everything in this world is by action therefore the karma is the primary focus dharmartha kama purushartham requires karma then the karma becomes so fine still karma but it becomes more of mental action not for the worldly pursuits but for a very esoteric spiritual progress is called upasana so upasana is also a karma we can simply say upasana is bhakti but bhakti is a very very generic flow of devotion unconditional without any constraints and forms as upasana is a very specific way of worshiping meditating the supreme so this is still a karma karma means what karma means an action you know in the world we all know that we have to do action but every time you do an action the outcome of the action is not something you can predict no matter how 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 intelligent you are how powerful you are any action that you do it may give a result it may not give a result that you expect that unpredictability is the very nature of action any action given that uncertainty in the risk management what we that we have to do we do all the understanding of the action we do perfectly but still we provide for a provision that it may not happen when that risk is not managed the provision is not responsibly handled we have trouble we cannot accept failures you know we cannot accept any loss because we think that everything has to be in our control but karma continuously prove that no everything is not in your control then bhagavan says in gita well this is the nature of life you can't therefore say i won't do anything because karma is unpredictable i will be an akarma akarmavadi you can't do that because by very nature you are bound to do action therefore bhagavan says there is a way out of this you still have to do karma but the unpredictability of karma karma palam which causes trouble anxiety and fear you do it as a karma yoga so therefore the ishvara pranidhanam he just now heard also in bhagavad gita the ishvara pranidhanam you must understand it is 
both karma yoga and bhakti yoga why it is karma yoga because every action we do which we need to do and we know that the outcome of the action is not in our control therefore we tell this action to the god and say look i am doing it in your name ishra pradhanam anything i do my official work homework friendly work personal work adhyatma vidya anything i do i do in the name of god and therefore anything that i get back as a result of the action i take it as a ishra prasadam so ishra pranidhanam is ishra pradhanam ishra prasadam now because you do this what happens is that you have the you know we all saw all that nakriya yoga this is how you get acceptance to everything anxiety goes away fear goes away but you see when you develop this karma yoga the bhakti comes along with this without the bhakti you cannot be a karma yogi even you can be a atheist you may not have a god but when you do this job when you do, do the job for the job sake you are already become a devoted person to that prakriti so ishra pranidhanam is both karma yoga and bhakti yoga both are unpredictable in result that's the reason why we trust in god but is there anything that is for sure no predictability issue that is where the third part of the vedas final part of the vedas called vedantam comes in jnana because jnana is not karma understand jnana is not karma jnana margam is not also acquiring jnana because if you acquire it will go away jnana margam is also is to shed the ajnana jnana margam is to shed the darkness in us how how is it guaranteed bhagwan says jnana meva kaivalyam only upon jnana only when you apply the jnana to your transformative progress vigyanam it becomes kaivalyam for sure how sure it is the example is like you know if i put my glasses on my head forehead i looking for it and you tell me the glass is on you the moment i know it i got it i don't have any action so therefore we have to do this karyam karmas there is unpredictability unpredictability we cannot manage but we have to do therefore we do kriya yoga ishra pranidhanam karma yoga bhakti yoga but then we want predictable result the predictable result is kaivalyam jnanam for that i need jnanam therefore i go to the vedanta for jnanam and vedanta said well to get the jnanam your mind has to be pure so we came to patanjali give me the purity mechanism and he said put back to the first principle go back and do the kriya yoga karma yoga ishra pranidhanam so we we said yeah i will do all that but give me a little bit more precise measures then he said okay i will leave it to you for the worldly action what we need to do now if you look at this logical sequence karma upasana jnana therefore i am doing the karma yoga i must go to the jnana therefore i must pass through this upasana therefore patanjali says well the sadhana path is most critical input import that for is you become a upasaka you are able to do upasana what is upasana means so upasana nama samana pratyaya pravaga karanam bhagavan shankara says in sutra bhashyam samana pravaga karanam samana means the same same idea same concept pravagam it is flooding so what makes it in you the same thing floods again and again and again that means you are in upasana 
So that Upasana can be a no Upasana Bhakti to God. It could be a, a poetry you write or a book you read. When you when you what you're focusing on, when that alone is in Prabhagam, that alone is fulfilling your mind, you are in Upasana. Now, that's a very good definition. If you take the definition, therefore, the Upasana I need to have is to get the Purusha. We, we are not talking about Patanjali's Darshana, Yoga Darshana. Purusha, the Purusha needs to be separated from the Prakriti. Separation is called the Kaivalyam. So therefore, Upasana is therefore, should be in what I need to realize, the Purusha. Therefore, the Upasana therefore means, Asana means seat. Upa means closer. So Upasana means sitting closer to what you need to get, what you need to realize. Therefore, Upasana means sitting close, if you say God, okay, you can take God, sitting close to God. Or if you're doing a, a Vedantic meditation, you would say sitting towards the Atma sitting closer to the Atma. Therefore, you have to do very close, you know, if you need to be closest to the person that you can be, is you. Everything else away from my body. So therefore, I must sit in where, sit in myself. That is Upasana. Now, Patanjali is keeping Upasana later. But he says, before you can talk about Upasana, you have to understand Asana. You must be able to sit in a place. Well, don't say I know how to sit. But this sitting is for the Upasana. So before you come to the sitting, I will give you some more called Yama Niyama. So I give you these eight Angas, Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama. Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadha, Samadhi, Eva, Ashta, Angani. We saw this. So I give you eight limbs, eight steps. We have to progress gradually. So you can see asana comes there. This asana is not upasana. This is even before that. He's, he's telling us you don't even know how to sit. Well, let's see what he says. So therefore, First, we started with Yama and Niyama. Don't forget, this is very important. There are five Yamas, five Niyamas. Yamas are the do's, sorry, do, don't do's. Niyamas, the do's. So we, we saw that in detail and we said, to get this Yama, what is the benefit of it? How, what should a benefit I get it? Ahimsa, for example. Ahimsa is the first niyama, the most fundamental niyama. When your nature becomes non-violent, non-violent, non-injurious by your body, mind, and action to anybody else, you get some benefits. See, eventually it talks about two kinds of benefits. The mukhya palam and avantra palam. Avantra palam means a secondary benefit the primary benefit. The secondary benefit you don't really look for, it comes to you, it's a side benefit. Mukhya benefit, Mukhya Palam is what you're looking for. But what is important to me may not be important to you. Therefore, in any pursuit, it's not necessary that Mukhya Palam is same as you and I seek because we may seek differently. But here he talks about for the final goal. I give example. So, for example, you want to go to Mount Kailash, Kailash Yatra. Uh, the guide says, let you get fit. You go for uh, jogging, go for the trekking, do all the exercises. So, your, your goal is to go to Mount Kailash. Therefore, you do all the exercises. So, the Mukhya Palam you're going to get is the fitness to go to Mount Kailash. But what happens is that you, you, you walk around, run around, Suddenly you find your isnophilia gone, your blood pressure has come to normal, your muscles are toned, 
you get a good, better appetite, you become healthy. Well, you are not thinking about those things. These things happen. Even otherwise, you, this is Drishta Palam. You get Zabantra Palam, not a Mukya Palam, Avantra Palam. It happens naturally. And you go to the Kailash Yadra, and uh, the, before the week you go, it's flooding rain. But the week you go, sunshine. Everything works out beautifully. How come it is happening? Coincidental randomness, you say. See, all the devatas are helping you go because you tried, you do upasana in your in your pursuit, you look for it. See, all the devatas are the you have the Soviet chief, they, they are giving the they take the orders from the Prakriti and the Prusha from the Ishvara, and then they take care of everything else. You know, you know even a simple household to manage it. You know, I need a maid, I need a cleaner, I need a gardener, and uh, even the household, we say, okay, you take care of this, I take care of this. But to run this prabhanjam, you need a lot of people, a lot of power. So God, therefore, manifests a lot of shaktis into devatas. That's why we say 3.3 million devatas. And it's not nonsense. It is right. So this the rain god is there. Sun god is there. So all these gods are adjusting their grace on us. And in return, you know, you remember, Aparikraha, we don't take anything from anybody without giving equivalent cost effort. This is very important in resolving samsara. We should not owe anything, owe anybody anything. So therefore, these gods are giving me good things. How do I worship them? How do I give them what they need? It's called Devarinam, Rishirinam, Panchamaha Yagyams we do. I told you before about it. You, you, you offer things to the gods. It is, it may sound symbolic, but it is powerful. It does give some results back. So the Yama Niyamas are like that. When we do something, you get the Mukya Palam and Avantra Palam. So Ahimsa, of course, all this Mukya Palam is Chitta Vritti, Nirodham. But the Avantra Palam is in Ahimsa, when you are non-violent, at your Sanidhi, at your presence, enmity is gone, amity, everybody is fraternal, the friendship is there, love is there, not only in you, everybody around you every beings around you. So this means even at least one person at home be very non-violent, the whole family changes generally. All the Abandra Palams or may or may not because they're all karmas. We do come from the karmas. May, may not. But that is the principle. Then we saw Satyam. Satyam is another Yama. That means don't lie. Therefore you be truthful. We saw all that. And the, what is the problem for it when you do that? When you always speak the truth, whatever you say becomes the true nature. Which means when you say something, it happens. The action and the results happen as you say, the das too. So that is the power you get. Then asteyam is asteyam means stealing. Stay means stealing. Asteyam means non-stealing. And when you don't do it, of course, the Avandra Palam is you have a capacity to see treasures everywhere, wherever it's hidden, where others cannot see. Okay, we can take it to mean. When you are uh, not stealing anything, you are prosperous. You are always comfortable. Your ends are met. You know, when you don't take anybody's property, you have no problem in life. Everything goes smoothly. We can take it that way. Then Brahmacharyam. Brahmacharyam is another. Don't do anything to, to, to knock down your Brahmacharya brother. 
celibacy, the right conduct. And then we saw the, even there's a Mukhya Palam itself, you get the Virya Palam. Your, your, your Ojas, Tejas, Prana becomes very purified and powerful. Your embodiment, your faculties of knowledge and action becomes so fine. You become a very fit person. Then Aparikraha means indulgence, not indulgence. And if you have a, a life of Aparikraha, then you get many good benefits. The Avandra Palam Patanjali quote was Purva Janma Drishti. You are able to see what you have born before. I don't know what is the benefit of it, but you get that power. Of course, if you do this to get that power, that becomes your Mokya Palam. Then he talked about five Niyamas. Niyamas are the do's. What are the Niyamas to remember? Saucham, Sandosham, Tapas, Swadhyayam, Ishra Pranidhan. Saucham, he gave a lot of importance, cleanliness, to be clean. He gave two sutras. Bhakya Saucham and Andhra Saucham. Outside cleanliness and inside cleanliness. So when you do the outside cleanliness, what do you have? You remember that? Swayanga Jugupsa Parahi. So you, you would start learning and you keep on cleaning your um, ambience, your body. It keeps on getting dirty, but you keep on cleaning it. When you keep clean, it looks fresh and nice. But then you learn that this is eternally uncleanable. It will become dirty. <clears throat> Therefore, that gives you vairagya. So you, therefore, you started respecting the body. See, sometimes some Vedantis don't take much to the yoga parampara, yoga thing, where they think that you no know, yoga asana, all these things, bodily exercises, all this, they create their adhyasam. They think like that. It's not like this. You have to have a strong body, have a strong, clean body. So, that is the power of cleaning outside. But when you clean inside, cleaning inside means cleaning your senses, your mind. Patanjali said, five important benefits. If you recall, this is on the last class. What are the five ones? The first one is Sattva Shuddhi. Your mind becomes more Sattvic thoughts. Why? How is it? It's so very logical, you know, 90% of the time, if I'm listening to good things, good company, my mind can only contemplate on that. So naturally your thoughts is filled up with sattvam, sattvam get more purified. So you become a very good person. The ones, that's not good enough. You have to be a pleasant and strong person. So then the second benefit is saumanasana. So Manasomya means beloved. So Manasa means very loving, comfortable, pleasant, yet strong. Strong, because you need to be strong. You just cannot be you know, causing violence to yourself. Somebody is not happy with you, you know, they didn't talk to you, and you get sensitive, and you're a very good person, but you're hurt because somebody is not talking to you. But when you hurt, we, we very quickly we come to myself. Sympathy is uh, many a times our not a virtue. It's a, it's a vice because we we we, we embrace self sympathy. Who is there to help me? I am alone. You don't nobody understands me. You know, it may give you some some attention, but it is very addictive. You, you start always doubting yourself on it, but you are you are doing himsa to yourself. Like himsa is sarva bhutani. For anything, you should not do himsa, including yourself. So, so manasa is the mind which is not only pleasant, strong. Nothing affects him. Just by clean, just by listening to good things, you become a so manasya. Now, once I got the clean, strong mind, so what I'm able to do, I'm able to put the mind on things that I need to put the mind on. See, he's building towards Upasana. 
the mind becomes stronger, I can see, okay, I want to know, listen to this lecture, whatever this fellow is teaching, telling, I want to listen to. If you, if you think that, you will listen to what I say. Now. Your mind is just going to stay, it's going to run away. So, I gagriyam. I gagriyam, I gagriyam. That on which you want to put it. Even though you are putting the mind to what I'm saying right now, try to focus on it. Something else distract you. Uh, a beautiful person passing by, the phone murmurs, the nice smell comes. So Indriya is coming there and giving you interruptions. Come on, there's something interesting going on. But when you have a clean mind, you get an Indriya jaya. You are able to tell your mind, senses, shut up, wait outside. I don't need you. So that you get. So you can go on like this. Therefore, potentially concludes the fifth benefit. If you achieve all this, you get Atma Darshana Yogyatvani. You get the Yogyada qualification to do Atma Darshana. What does he mean by that? That means if you go sit on Upasana, what do you want to see in Upasana? You will get it. That means in Yama, Niyama, our behavior, which is external behavior changes, when we control it, we are fit for the purpose, mentally and sensually. Sensory uh, controls are there for you. Then he moves, okay, so far so good. Now let me look at you. He says, asana. Okay. If you are expecting we are going to stand up and do yoga asana, I will disappoint you. Patanjali is not talking about it. There is no yoga yama, yoga niyama, yoga pratyagara, like that. But there is a yoga asana, yoga asana. So the asana has taken up in the ashtanga yoga. See, the, the ashtanga yoga, the whole thing is called Famously populated by Bhagavan uh, Swami Vivekananda, it's called Raja Yoga. So whenever you see Raja Yoga, it is this Ashtanga Yoga, the regal path to walk. People mistake it, and there are there are even great scholars go in the path. Raja Yoga is different from Bhakti Yoga, or Karma Yoga, or Jnana Yoga. And if you go to the internet, they say there are four types of yoga: Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga. How wrong they can be. They are not independent paths. We already saw the, the, the first step, Yama Niyama, Kriya Yoga, Ishara Pranidhani, is Dharma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga and together. So you need to have that. So the Raja Yoga, so you somebody say, look, uh, I am a Shiva Bhakta. I am going through Shiva Upasana, Shiva Brahma. Why, why do you need this Ashtanga Yoga? Or I am Vishnu Bhakta, or I am an atheist. No, I am doing good things. Whatever you do, if you take Ashtanga Yoga, it's going to make that process better. Because this process is not about a particular God, particular dogma, particular religion. It is universal. It is making your behavior, Niyama Niyama, then if you look at it, asana is on your physical posture. How your physical annamaya kosha. You know, you're going to be do pasana. You, the person going to do pasana, you're going to come with, not with your whole family, you're going to come yourself. But the guru says, okay, you come yourself, but you still have baggage. What baggage? What I see in the body, annamaya kosha. It has to have certain contact in the Upasana. It has to stay put in a place. How do I do that? I'll teach you, but that's called Asana. You must get Asana Jayam, Asana Siddhi. Asana is needed for Upasana. But even to get the Asana, you need to have practice. So that is the, of course, then what happened was uh, Yajna Valkyar, not the Upanishad Yagyamal, there's another Yagyamal who took this uh, 
Patanchali is Ashtanga Yoga. And then he elaborated into another yoga sadhanas. There's a grantham there. Then Machyayana, then Gorakar. There are a lot of lineage was there. And the latest and the, the most authentic today on the asanas is by Swa Swami Swatmarama. It's called Hatha Yoga Pratipika. Hatha Yoga Pratipika. So in Hatha Yoga Pratipika, he take uh, Ashtanga Yoga, but he mainly focusing on Asana Pranayama. Yama names are just one, one line. But in all those Grandas, Yoga Vasishtam, all these Grandas, the Ashtanga Yoga's purport is not changing. It is to be ready to conduct Upasana to get that Jnana. Of course, today you have so many Yogasanas. Yogasana become a separate study, separate class, and uh, uh, it's very interesting to do, and I think uh, it keeps your body fit. But for Patanjali's point of view, he's going to say three sutras, that's it. His, his goal is tell you about the asana and how to make it an asana siddhi for you so that you can sit in upasana. So we will see that. Then, is that not is that enough? No, you not only come with your body, but you also come with your yeah, pranamaya kosha. It's not a dead body; it's a living body. There's energy flowing. There's uh, something going through. Prana is not the air. Pranayama is not no, breath control. Breath control is not that. It is about regulating the flow of energy in the body. Prana is life energy. So pranayama is the an exercise or a yajnama, I would say, a tapas in which the energy that flows in the physical body, the physical body is sitting in a, in a particular posture, an asana, good for the upasana, is supplemented or energized by the prana that flows. I have certain techniques to, Patanjali says, I have certain techniques to tell you how the prana, prana flows can be can, controlled, regulated. And there are a lot of Mahatmas given so many techniques today. Again, no, there, there are 18,000 asanas, there are 84 asanas, 34 asanas. No, we just need one which makes it good for upasana. Same way pranayama, there are so many different pranayamas. There are certain pranayamas that you need to do so that you can be fit for upasana. So, so we, we will go through in Patanjali's way so that the knowledge we get is applicable to all persons of all age at all times. So any specialist skill that you need to know, you need to take the right teacher, right practice, and you can continue. Maybe some of you may be already doing all these things. You may be experts in this. So I, I have very limited knowledge. I will not see all this, but I will only go through the important things for purpose for the upasana. So this is a pranayama, pranamaya course. Then there's a manomaya kosha, but between pranamaya kosha and manomaya kosha is sitting there. It's a very subtle part. It's the indriyas. So in the manomaya kosha, he's dealing with first with the indriyas. Because you've got, you got a good posture, your breathing is going well, but you got the smell of upma, smell of sugar, sweet is tempting you. That means your pratyaharam is not there. Therefore, he is giving you sensory control, body control, prana control, sensory control in pratyahara. Okay, I'm getting better now, right? Then he says, okay, then I'll deal with you, your mind, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. It's all mind, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Dharana, you can say the manomaya question, making the mind empty. And dhyana can be having dhyanamaya question because it is where you transforming transforming meditation with the dhyasana we do. And samadhi is the anandamaya question. 
So now he says, in the Ashtanga Yoga, Yama Niyama gives you your worldly behaviors and conduct. So if you are following Yama Niyama, people know you are a, an aspiring yogi because the way you conduct yourself, you are truthful, you know, non-violent, not stealing, non-falsehood, upright, clean, tapasvi, self-study, satsang participant, satsang. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, Swadhyaya. You do self study. Anishra Pranidhani. You do all that. Yama Niyama. Then you come to Adhyatma Vidya. My asana. I am how I am going to conduct myself, my physical body. Asanas. How I am breathing. Pranayama. How I. Ahara means eating. Pratyahara. You eat. What is giving you the eating? So you basically eat the chef, you know. The chef is the sensory organ. They, they, they go and get all these interesting nuggets of information in the world, cook as an enticing information and gives you, yeah, hey, look at this WhatsApp message. Yeah, read it, forward it 100 times. Then you say, okay, you sense sensory organs doing this thing. I don't need you. I'll eat you up for a while because I'm doing dhyana. Don't disturb me. That you do dharana, dhyana. We'll go through all this in the end. So, so this is the Ashtanga Yoga. So you must understand Ashtanga Yoga is to lead towards the Upasana. So if you follow this, and after the after this thing, and if you practice it, you are in a position to perform Upasana anytime, anywhere that you decide to do. Why should I do Upasana? Because by doing upasana, I am near to what I am doing upasana for. In other words, whatever I want to achieve, I achieve it because I will be very close to it. Why he doesn't say take it away? Why you say why don't say prasadam? Why say upasana? Actually, Ishwara grace is needed. You may be very close to Ishwara. Manika Vachika, Ganeshwara, all these great Mahans, they have understood everything but they were you know they were toiling tapas they were still looking for the fulfillment that grace have to be there from the god and the buddhi has to come so you can be only as close as you are but if you're as close to where you want to be 100 percent guarantee is there it'll happen so this is ashtang okay sorry i took a long time this is for the recap now you go to the asana First Shutra, Sthira Sukham Asanam. That's it. He finished Asana definition. Sthira Sukham Asanam. Asanam, Idam Asanam, we say. Asanam means the, the, the root as means to sit. Asyate Iti Asanam, in which you sit is Asanam. So now we should actually look at it in uh, two ways okay. you don't three ways but i said two ways asanam as something like i'm sitting on a chair this chair is my asana right so it is uh, uh so it is it's a, it's a inner thing on which i'm going to sit right okay so he is saying asana is not normally place where you sit. So what does it mean? He is telling me that to do upasanam, upasana or contemplation, meditation, dhyanam, I must sit down. Well, I'm a busy man. Can I not do when I'm swimming, when I'm running, when I'm walking? Well, you can, you can think of good things. You can do nama japam. But upasana cannot happen. Dhyanam cannot happen. Dhyanam has to be seated. Well, there are lots of uh, reasons why it is, but we just touch upon it generally. See, when you stand up, very, very practical reason. When you stand up, what happens is your, 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 your system have to really work out. Every time you stand up, there's a lot of things happening in your body. There's a control system which maintains your body. Stability needed. You know, as a young people, you know, 
you will not understand the importance of walking, standing. When you are getting older, when you get disease, when standing is difficult, but you realize that how important it is. Therefore, when you stand up, your brain, your neurons, your heart pumps you know, blood. There are a lot of systems interruptions going on to keep your body straight. Stand. That means your energy is dissipating everywhere. I need to conserve energy because Egagram, I need to bring all the energy to what I need to do. So therefore, I will not stand up. Okay. How about lying down? Comfortable. Everything at rest. Savasana, I know it. Just lying down is Savasana. I can do. Can I do Dhyanam there? Well, energy is there. The energy is not available to you. Why? The moment you lie down, in few seconds, you'll be snoring. Sleep, deep sleep. Alasya will come. Sleep will come. Gudakesha. Arjuna is one you, when you come to Dhyanam, Vedantam, and Yoga, you must be able to conquer sleep. Sleep is very important. As you grow older, you know, five, six hours sleep is important. But more than the duration of the sleep, what is important is how you go into sleep and how you come out of the sleep. You can, one hour sleep is good enough. If you know how you go into sleep, how you come out of the sleep. So therefore, while going to sleep, I must do something so that I go well. When I come out of sleep, I must do something that I come out well. Those filters are there in the Yoga Shastra. Dhyanam is one of them, the ultimate of them. So therefore, I cannot lie down and do Dhyanam. I can't stand up and do Dhyanam. Therefore, I must sit down. It's common sense, right? It's so simple. But it's very important to understand. Then you understand the importance of sitting. So here we take the first meaning. Asana means that is external to you in which you sit, sit upon. And he gives you two words for it. Sthira Sukha. Sthira means what? It has to be strong. Non-vacillating. Stable. Firm. Steadfast. So which means I can't I can't swing in a in a in a in a Jula and do dhyana. You know, when you do Veda Dhyayanam, no, yeah, Swadhyayam is a dhyana in a way that tapas. Some people say, mm, like this, you know, they keep on adding this way or this way. It's very addictive. You know, you, your body is motion, it's not serum. You should not do. Occasional little bit movement is fine, but you must consciously. So the, the, here you're talking about the external seat. It has to be. So, so I take, normally we use a yeah, wooden bench, small bench. It's ideally good to sit as close to the ground. Therefore, a wooden bench like this is, is good enough. You should not sit on the floor. First, the physical comfort, because your, your knee, your ankle will have to get hurt. Therefore, you must sit on this. Therefore, your, uh, your ankles are not really pressing onto the floor. But I can't sit on the floor because I can't fold my leg. Sit on a chair, but not on a swinging chair, rolling chair. Chair, which is for theorem. Therefore, it doesn't move left, right, up, down. So it's simple. Sira Asanam, I found this chair or thing. I got it. But when I sit on it, it hurts my bottom. It hurts my leg after some time. So what do I have to do to make the asana comfortable? Put something, put a cushion on top of it. Rubber mat. Or you can put even a, even a one more thing, you know, blanket, put the blanket there. And make sure that your, your, your knuckles or the, the bones are not really pressing against the floor will hurt you know there are some some people crazy they say stira asana means must be a rough place go and do dhyana or sitting on a rock no 
Bhagavan so kindly says, no? when you do Gita, we learn more. He talks about, no, don't sit in a high place, low place, dark place, not near water, not near fire. So the seat where you sit has to be comfortable. And as if, you know, if you wear a dress or garment or a shoe, after some time, you don't even know you are wearing it, right? That is Sukha. If you, it always demands you, I am, you are wearing me and I am uncomfortable to you, that's not Sukha. So you just be like that. So you have to really, this is difficult to find. Why it is difficult to find? You may say, look, I am, I am, I am crouching on my sofa all the time when I flip through Netflix all the time. I'm in a comfortable position in the sofa. The so sofa is my Stira Sukha Masana. No, if you look at the second meaning of asana, you will know that is not a fit one. So staying with the first one, the asana must be firm and it has to be comfortable. And the, the location, it is not in the, the, the sutra, but in the, in the expansion, you should understand. The location where this seat is there has to be siram and sukha. Okay, I am sitting on a right chair, but I'm on a moving car. The chair is steady, comfortable cushion. It's a moving car. No. So the ambience has to be steady. Or it is windows are open. The air is flowing. Breeze is coming. Cold. No. So you make sure the conditions of where you need to do the upasana, the hanam, as comfortable. And you've got a seat. I would even go one step ahead of this. You also mark the time and the location. Because you know, you will learn it more. Why? You know, when you when you learn piano or a keyboard, they ask you to practice certain keys. You know, you keep on doing it. Uh, and they say it is the fingers learning. So the fingers learn how to do it. At some time, you know, when you try to play in both hands, it's very difficult to play. But after some time, you play, you don't even know that you're playing. Like in a tennis in a game, you know, backhand, you know, you turn 40 degrees and then swing the arm, go straight forward, the elbows extended, all that you practice, practice. After a few years, it's a breeze. Right? So like that, if you are used to a same time, same location, same seat for the Anna, your body get conditioned. When you, when you get used to a seat and you can sit there comfortably for one hour, two hours, tomorrow you go and sit in a much more comfortable you know, foam bed, you won't feel the same thing. Girls, your, your, your physical cellular tissues and everything has got used to and adjusting to that. That's the first meaning. So we need to identify. People are already doing piano, you may, you may just validate what I'm saying is correct or wrong. Others who want to take up dhyana should first thing to start that I must have this seat and location right out. There is another meaning to asana. That is the posture. How I am sitting. We can, we can, I can give you in a different way. Even if you stick with the first definition, asana means something external in which you sit. Before it is, I find out Sedam and Sukham. Then as you are, you are already a Vedanta expert and you know it. Before when I am sitting for Upasana, the I, who is the I? Let's just say the Jiva, the Sukshma Sariram. Or even go to the Atma, the Sukshma Sariram. I going to sit in where I am sitting, I am sitting in the sthula sariram. So for the sukshma sariram, what is the seat? Sthula sariram. So you are sitting in your body. Embody. Embodiment is what? You are pervading, sitting, using your body as your seat. You are seated in your body. So if you take the first definition itself, or if you want to make it simple, I got a seat, which is a wooden bench. Now the second definition of asana is asyate nena asana. How I am sitting? What is the posture? So 
I would take the first definition much easier because you're, you're going to narrate to you. So the body is my seat. I am sitting on my body. My mind is going to sit on this body. Therefore, I have to apply this two rules. Sthira, Sutta, Asana. So I must make my body Sthiram, make my body Sukha. Now, this puts in a difficult position for us. So when I said that, then you immediately went, went to the kitchen, took a wooden bench and put it in a, in a prayer room, put a cushion on it, ready to do upasana, dhyana. But it is now your body has to be sthira. I am hunching back. My legs cannot fold. Even when I sit down, I don't know what to do with my hand. I can't keep the head straight. Can I lean back on something? So you have so many things in your body that you are not able to control it. So therefore, I'm not able to apply this Tirasukha Masanam conditions to my physical embodiment, which is my seat, or the posture I need to do. So this theorem means keeping the body straight. So the one advantage is because he's going to be sitting, right? Sitting is awesome. Therefore, you have already given up the lower part of your body. What is more important than the sitting posture is your torso, which is basically torso is your main trunk of your body and your head. Sarashe Pradhana. So your head and your torso have to be straight. Now, if I am straight, my back hurt because I'm not used to it. So many years I've been couching on the bread. Yes, it is difficult. Therefore, don't start this pranayama asana, all this now. Let us practice to make our body sthiram. And you'll be amazed how quickly it will turn, react to, by doing simple physical exercises. I'm not expecting anybody to put the leg over the head and bend over backwards, and maybe the youngsters can do that. We don't need that. I'm not saying we don't need it. You need it, it's very good, but that you need to go to a proper, authorized, licensed, good practitioner to teach you. When you're young, you take it up. When you grow older, you see, a lot of internet, there are a lot of stuff there, you know? You know, Zoom, you can have lessons, you can have letters, you can have text. You can read it, look at the picture you can do. But it's very dangerous, you know? Yoga, asanam, hatha yogam. Hatha, sometimes people translate hatha as ha means sun, ta means moon, hatha means uh, sun, moon, balancing and all kind of stuff. Hatha simply means exertion, effort. Hatha yoga means, Hatha yoga asanam means this asanam for the yoga has to be by some effort. It's not a free, free lunch. Therefore, if you go to Hatha yoga class, you expect to have effort. And it is not like, you know, like uh, there are Arabic exercises where you know, after doing that, you, you're breathless, you are like a dog, you are breathing the tongue out and that is all dangerous. That's not what is, when you finish exercise, you feel comfortable and succumb. When you do the exercise, it is succumb. So that's what yoga is nice. So but for us, it's going to be maybe four or five asanas they suggest for dhyana of which I would say just one is good enough. Even if that is not good enough, that's not possible for you, you can use your chair, sit there, only two conditions, three conditions, four conditions. First condition, your torso should be straight, not like this, too straight, the spine goes convex, no as comfortable as possible. 
the lower hip, the lower part of your thing, where the spine ends, needs some support, gentle support. You fold a towel and keep it there. And the upper part of the back rests on the chair. And then your legs are 90 degrees. Knees bent, it goes 90 degrees. And when you do that, you just gently go back to the point where you can barely see your 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 tummy. Okay, my tummy is bigger, so I can't do it. So do that. Then I have to do something with the hand. You no know, hand is very okay. I sit there. You know, hand is very difficult to control sometimes. You know, sometimes very animated. They talk like this, this way, that way, or they bite the nails and uh, you know, do like this, and uh, you keep on doing something which with the hand. But we need to really see the legs and the on the hands are upankams, subsidiary organs. They are not important for the dhyana, but they only have to be an aid for that. An aid. Therefore, there are a couple of ways in which the yoga charyas give us some task to give to the feet and the fingers. So if you're able to sit down, there are four asanas for dhyanas. You can go to the internet or books, you can read it. One is called Padmasana, where you cross your legs. Don't try it if you don't know how to do it. Even if you try it with somebody's help and do it, and if you need two people to untangle you, and it's not good. Padmasana is good. If you're young and you are you're starting up flexible, do that. This is called Siddhasana, where you see on the picture there. Uh, with the right leg or left leg, which can, whichever can be on the top. So one leg, the heel goes to your perineum, which is basically goes behind your rectum. Basically, you're sitting halfway on your back heel. The other leg comes on top of it. And spread as much as possible. Slightly difficult if you have never done it before, but much easier than other, other four asanas. I can't do this, I can just have to fold it and normally I sit there with one left goes to the right, right goes to the left. By the way, all these asanas is applicable for both gender. There's no problem with that. So you can do that. It's called swastika asana. So because sukhasana, you know, like Lord Ayapa sits slightly differently. I won't go into details of it because it's not needed. Just find a way, preferably sitting on the floor. If you cannot do it, on a chair. Chair, of course, you cannot fold your leg. You can keep it there. Without going too much detail, I tell you, when you, when you sit down on the chair, put some clothing on the floor so that your feet can rest on it. Not feet touching on the ground. One of the purpose of sitting for the leg is both your palms, you know, your palms, your underneath of your feet, uh, your armpits, your elbow pits, the neck part, the backs of the ears. There they say the prana's movement is high, it generates heat, it dissipates energy. Because you, you know, you go to all this tantric school, there they have. Uh, chapter and verse on each one. Uh, but I'm purposely not going into too deep into this because this is not needed, all this. But the simple rule is that you don't really put your palms on the ground, except when you do exercise. Or put your feet on the floor when you do the dhyana, upasana. But if you have to sit on the chair, obviously, many of us need to sit on the chair to do this uh, thing. Nothing wrong with this. Please put a towel or something so that your feet can be there. Or if you are able to sit like a Dakshina Murti, where I fold one leg on top or other leg. And for the other leg, he got a lucky, he got Moyalakan under his feet, so he's got a comfort. You can put a pillow or cloth so that you can have one foot on, on a towel, other leg is on this. But you need to find what is giving you steadiness. So the hand you can do. 
So the hand, if we have time and if you need to do, we'll, we'll talk about it, mudras. You know, mudras are important for the city. Mudra, hasta mudra means um, basically how I employ my fingers in the hand. Like if I do this, I'm doing a mudra. Mudra means a symbol. What mudra I'm doing now? I'm doing namaste to you. I'm doing Anjali mudra. Some fancy name. That is Anjali mudra. So, so when you sit, there's going to be there are 20, 25 different mudras, maybe five, six, seven of them, useful to know. And there are also certain certain powers. Maybe the next, what's the time? Okay, I'll let me finish now. So you can, so you, you, so there are certain certain knowledge they are given by the Mahatmas. We can learn that. So we can give some orders to their leg and the fingers. Sukam. Now, when I sit on the posture, I, am I feeling comfortable? You will say, no, I'm not. That means you have to refine, adjust yourself. See, discomfort from the pain, differ, differentiate this. Discomfort happens when your muscles are not used to. That is a learning discomfort. So suppose you, you pay to the gym every month, but you never go. Suddenly you wake up, new year resolution, I want to go to the gym. You go the first day, over enthusiastic, you take the dumbbells, do all the stuff. You come back one week, your hands are painful and you don't go. But that pain is a comfortable pain. This is a learning pain. The muscle says, look, you didn't give me all that. So I'm, I'm a little bit fattened up by this. Give me again and again and again. So when it pains, you go next day, do the same exercise a little bit less. Third day, fourth day, then the muscle forms. It doesn't pain anymore. So that pain is a uh, little discomfort that you should train. But there are some acute pains may come. So you, you might have, please don't try anything and comply to me. So only in your feet you should do it. Make sure that you are comfortable. You have to sit in initially 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. When you're able to sit for 45 minutes to 60 minutes, the same posture with zero or minimum movements of your limbs. When you get out of it, you may have the, you know, uh, blood flow may not be there. So massage your legs, massage your hands. Do five minutes first, five minutes sitting there quietly. Don't, know, don't need to do any dhyana, nothing. Mind can wonder, listen to music if you want, doesn't matter. I would say nothing, but if you want to. But time it that, that five minutes, you don't move any limb. Don't control your breathing, nothing. You just be as usual, but you are exercising, you are doing to get the asana jaya, that you are able to find a comfortable position where you are able to prolong for long time. So five minutes in the first week, then 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, if you're able to sit there, then it is so beautiful because the body is now waiting for your command. Like, you know, like a car when you, Start it on, it starts it, you put a break, it stops, you know, it just obeys to you. Same way the body should obey to you. So, so, but before you sit down, you do some flexible exercises. Okay, again, this is this I don't need to say because you're all experts or you may have trainers. Uh, the the simple thing in 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 the an Ayurvedic medicine approach is that every limb joint that can rotate, you rotate it. So your neck rotation like this, okay, gently, it does very, very gently because you may sprain your leg. Then your shoulders rotation, very gently, up and down. And then your, your elbow rotation. Then your hands rotation. Then your fingers like this all the limbs, then your hip, then your knees, then sit down and hold one ankle and rotate the ankle. Gently. So you count it, maybe 12 times is normally taken as one round. So you do each one 12 times. So there are eight, nine important joints. So it takes you five minutes, 10 minutes. Again, you do it. When do you have to do it? Before you go to sleep. 
and when you get up from the sleep. But before you go to sleep, if you eat a stomach full and go to bed, then you don't do this. I think you must actually wait one hour before you go to bed, finish your dinner, at least one hour. Then do simple flexible exercise. And later you can do simple dhyana, then go to bed. Beautiful sleep. When you get up, you do the same thing. Simple exercise, flexible exercise, dhyana. So this is what it means, sthira sukham asana. The posture of yoga is that which is steady and easeful. So I think what we have to do to really who wants to do practice of proper dhyana, find your seat and then find your posture and get the sthira sukham achievement. So we stop it here now. So, Om Ashadoma Shadhamayam. Om Asatoma Jyotir Gramaya, Amasoma Mityoma Amrudam Gamaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Om Thank you, Raja. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very useful. Thank you. 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 Thank